Our Lady of Grace, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today, the Mass of the first Sunday after Pentecost is resumed, and we commemorate today in the first place two martyrs, and then a great number of saints who enable us to see the wonderful work of the Holy Ghost in the Garden of the Soul and in the Garden of the Church down throughout the centuries. We remember the central role of Our Lady in this, that Our Lady of Grace is the Mediatrix of all graces, so that all of these graces of the Holy Ghost pass through her hands. Now, in today's epistle, the first of the epistles for the Sundays after Pentecost, which will occupy us and feed our spiritual lives for the whole of the summer season until, um, until, until the end of the fall and the coming of winter, in today's epistle, the Church insists on charity. We, we go to the very beginning again. We remember what that charity is and how it comes to us. It is God the Holy Ghost. As we saw on Ember Saturday, by his, it is poured out in us, St. Paul says, by his Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, dwelling in us. And so we insist on something very simple, something very profound. The love of God, and for the love of God's sake, uh, the love of our neighbor. In that sense, we, we look back to the past liturgical year, and we look back especially to the graces of Pentecost. But we also look forward now. Now we look forward to the Holy Ghost coming to us by means of Holy Communion. We have great confidence that by means of the Blessed Sacrament, frequent and indeed if possible daily Holy Communion, all of the work that needs to be done in us to make us become saints, not so much perhaps today we think in spite of our of characteristics, our individual personalities and our types of character, but through that, because God uses natural as well as supernatural means for our sanctification, His grace does indeed build on nature, the Holy Ghost, through those Holy Communions, will be sanctifying and strengthening us. So we look forward very much to the crowning feast of the liturgical year, beginning uh, tomorrow evening, uh, the first vespers of Corpus Christi. St. Primus and Felician were two old men, brothers already in their 80s, who had persevered their whole life long in the service of God, and they were arrested in Diocletian's persecution at the very end of the persecution. Uh, they uh, were delivered, first of all, from prison by an angel, and then later on, when uh, the judge tried to confuse one of these brothers and lied to him that his brother had apostatized and that he would do well to follow him, an angel, his guardian angel, enlightened him to the truth of the matter and strengthened him. For the other things that we have today, we have the feast of a great Irish saint and missionary, Saint Columba. And Columba is a wonderful example of reparation or penance for sin, and how, in spite of one's sometimes very strong natural character, great graces are still given. Saint Columba was trained to be a monk and a priest by Saint Finian, and from Saint Finian he was able to borrow the Psalter of Saint Jerome, which was a very precious book because it gave the, the true Psalms of David, and then as well as St. Jerome's commentary upon them. And surreptitiously and without permission, St. Columba copied, monks were great copyists of books, copied the Psalter. Later on, when his old teacher, the abbot, found out about it, he claimed that the book, uh, because he had copied his book without permission, and it went, it was, this is probably the first example of a, of a, of a lawsuit over ownership or of copyright questions, and it went to the High King of Ireland, and the High King was no friend of the clan of the O'Neills, from which St. Columba hailed, and he decided in favor of St. Finian. Shortly thereafter, there was a second dispute about the question of sanctuary. The High King's soldiers violated the sanctuary that St. Columba had offered to a certain man, and because of this, there was a war between the two clans, which St. Columba had in a sense incited. Three thousand were killed. And at the end of it, there was a synod, and St. Brendan interceded for St. Columba that he should not be excommunicated. But St. Columba was so, so filled with, the, with contrition as to what he had occasioned or caused that he made a vow that he would leave Ireland, which for an Irishman would, would of course, be the, one of the very greatest sacrifices possible. And he went to Scotland, and there he settled on the island of Iona, and uh, convert, went north from there. 
headquarters, converted quite a bit of Scotland, the Picts in particular. Uh, there was a certain uh, Scottish king who would not open his castle to him, and there he stood outside, and he made the sign of the cross, and the bolt flew open of their own under the power of God's cross, Christ's cross, and he was able to enter in and to convert the king at Inverness and to, to as I say, evangelize quite a bit of Scotland, so today is the feast day of St. Columba in Scotland. And in addition to this thing, it is interesting to consider how the Holy Ghost inspires uh, different ones in different ways. Sometimes they do things which are quite dramatic, leaving one's own country. Or in the case of St. Pelagia, who is a young virgin martyr at the age of 15, St. Jerome, uh, St. Uh, John Christensen tells us that she was inspired by God to uh, cast herself from a height rather than to suffer dishonor at the hands of the pagans by a special or particular inspiration of God the Holy Ghost. And seemingly at the opposite end would be one of the most recent saints who died in the 1830s in, uh, in Rome, the blessed Anna Maria Taigi, who was on the one hand the saint of the commonplace because she was a wife and a mother and a, and a housekeeper. But on the other hand, she was a profound mystic. She saw wonderful things of the spiritual life and wonderful things of what was going to happen to the church by means of the mystical sun, which always accompanied her. But at the same time, her advice was always very down to earth and very practical. She advised against attempting to do uh, very great deeds of penance, such as uh, the Irish monks would have done centuries before. St. Uh, Columba was a terrible man for that. He was just uh, a man of such profound and severe penance that it would scare away many. But Saint, uh, Blessed Anna Maria Taigi said, no, the devil may use the weakness that would come from those severe penances to get us to violate God's commandments or not to fulfill the duties of our state. And so she spoke against that kind of an approach to the spiritual life as did a certain um, saint of the Camelgelis order, a strict semi-aramidical branch of the Benedictines, a blessed Sylvester. He was a cook, but he was one of those who was inspired by the Holy Ghost. He was entirely without book learning, like St. Catherine of Siena, but he was, was able to sometimes settle the most profound theological debate. And he would tell the monks who would come to him, imagine coming to the cook for, for advice, well, that's, you could imagine that, and and many did. Uh, he would he would tell them very simple common sense. And again, he would say, "Don't attempt these great great penances. You just follow your, your your duty. Mortify yourself, and in that way, you'll be able to make great progress uh, spiritually." He had a. Um, it's interesting that one time one of the brethren came to him to discuss uh, impure temptations, and he simply remarked, "Well, that's to be expected." But another of the brothers came to him to say, I've been grumbling, I've been murmuring here in the monastery. And St. Benedict said in his rule that above all things, monks must avoid murmuring because there's nothing like murmuring to destroy any community, whether it be a family or whether it be a church or, or whatever, or a monastery. Well, he got, he sort of paid attention and his head went up. And he worked with the monk quite a bit to get him to never again murmur against the regime, against the abbot, or against the community life, because he knew that that sin against charity would destroy everything. He had such a profound love, and we go back to St. Columba again, who loved the Psalter, the chanting of the Psalms of David, which is how he got into trouble to start with. He too had a, he was a cook, but he had such a love for the divine office, he didn't know Latin, but it was infused into him. He would say sometimes with tears, how could anyone hear the divine office without being all broken up at its beauty. How beautiful is the Church of Christ in her worship, how beautiful she is in her sacramental power, and how beautiful in all these splendid examples of sanctity. We'll ask the Holy Ghost to take you back to the basics today. Uh, charity, love of God, and love of your neighbor, and the fulfillment of the duties of your state of life, just as Our Lady asks us at Fatima. And we'll conclude with a little devotion for the month of June. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. O God, the Holy Ghost, infinite love of the Father, and of the Son, through the hands of Mary, thy immaculate spouse, I offer myself this day, and all the days of my life, upon thy chosen altar, the divine heart of Jesus, as a holocaust to thee, 
O thou consuming fire, being firmly resolved, now more than ever, to hear thy voice and do in all things thy most holy and adorable will. Most loving Savior, out of gratitude for the infinite love thou dost bear toward me and in reparation for my unfaithfulness to thy graces, I give thee my poor sinful heart and I consecrate it wholly and forever to thy most sacred heart, begging thee to keep me from sin, all in reparation to the sacred heart of Jesus and to the immaculate heart of Mary. Our Lady of Grace, pray for us. May the divine assistance remain always with us. May the souls of the faithful departed to the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today we have the what is called the Resumed Mass of Sunday, because Sunday was the feast day of the Blessed Trinity. There uh, was no place for the ancient Sunday Mass, which is then resumed on this uh, weekday. Today we celebrate the feast day of uh, St. Primus and Felician, and commemorate these brothers who were martyrs, as well as Our Lady and all of the saints. God is charity, St. John writes to us in today's epistle. He that, he that abideth in charity, abideth in God, and God in him. In this we know that we have uh, received of him, he has given to us of his spirit. The first epistle of the long series of green masses that will be read to nourish the faithful throughout the whole of the summer and the coming autumn season, God willing, until cold weather comes again. The first epistle that's read speaks to us of the love of God. We've seen God the Holy Ghost come down upon us in uh, grace at Pentecost, especially on those who were confirmed. And now, today, the Church insists upon that fruit or sign of the presence of God, the keeping of the two great commandments, without which it would be impossible to say that in any sense we are serving Almighty God. Each one of us then, in some sense or another, has to always be allowing, not that we do it ourselves, but we allow the Holy Ghost to sort of clean us up and polish us up, to love God a little bit more generously, to love our neighbor a little bit more honestly and sacrificially. But this is something we can't do on our own. And that is why our Lord gives us the grace of frequent Holy Communion. Each Holy Communion is the Holy Ghost at work, drawing us a little bit closer to God, feeding us, healing us. It's a medicine for the soul, as well as a wonderful strength. Today we have an unusual panoply of saints who show how the Holy Ghost adjusts to each character and type of person and uh, situation in life his graces. To enable all of them to be saved. But nobody, nobody becomes a saint without loving God very, very much and loving his neighbor as himself for God's sake. Uh, the brothers that we have were brothers that got along, which is already saying something. These two brothers did. And their whole life long, till they were in their 80s, they persevered in the Christian faith during the time of persecution, the very end of the third century. And uh, there, uh, they were arrested finally in Rome, men in their 80s. They tried to lie the pagans did to them, saying, telling one brother apart from the other, well, your brother's apostatized. He's worshipped the idols. So why don't you just go ahead and do that too? But his guardian angel told them that it was not true. God's spirit at work and encouraging both of them to persevere unto death to some terrible torture in the practice of our faith. Now today is the feast day of an unusual Irish saint, the first of the great wave of missionaries who for over two centuries would make the sacrifice of leaving their beloved homeland, dear Ireland, to go all over Europe to spread the gospel and to rekindle the fire of Christian Catholic civilization. His name is St. Columba. St. Columba, St. Columba is, a, is a monk and a missionary. He's also noted as, as a warrior because the Irish were warriors and he had his fair share of wars in which he participated as a monk, curiously enough. But for all of them, he did a wonderful penance. He was educated by St. Finian, 
And as part of his education, as monks did back then, he learned very beautiful handwriting so that he could copy the sacred scriptures, which monks did by hand, and sometimes very beautifully produced books. Well, his abbot and teacher had received the first copy in Ireland of a precious book, the Psalter of St. Jerome. The psalm, copied accurately by St. Jerome, was commentary. And without thinking anything of it, he went ahead and made a copy of that book for himself without permission. When the old abbot found out about it, <coughs> there ensued what was in effect the first copyright trial that ever took place. And the matter was brought before the high king to adjudicate between the two because the old abbot claimed that was a copy of his book and it belonged to him, therefore. And uh, the king ruled in his favor. He said, to every cow it's calf and to every book it's copy. Now, uh, St. Columba belonged to the O'Neill clan and they were no friends of the clan of the high king. And there was a conflict between the two. Soon after that, the high king's soldiers violated the right of sanctuary, whereby a Catholic priest could receive into the church for protection any kind of an accused criminal. And because of that, uh, because of these two events, there was a war. And during this war, 3,000 men were killed. And Colombo was at least partly to blame for it. And there was a church synod called, and he was censured, and he would have been excommunicated had not St. Brendan spoken up for him and defended him out of a uh, sense of sorrow for sin that he had committed and uh, to make reparation for it, he took a vow to leave Ireland and to go as a missionary and never to look upon another man or woman in the face, he said, uh, on Irish soil. So he went to the island of Iona off of Scotland. There he established a, a, a great and a prosperous monastery. And then he went into Scotland with his monks to preach the gospel. There's a wonderful illustration of the power of the sign of the cross Father Romola told us about on Sunday when he went to uh, the area called Inverness, the local baron or king had his castle bolted shut against the Irish missionary and he wasn't about to give up his pagan religion. Well, St. Columba, making one sign of the cross, was able to cause uh, the bolts to open up on the castle gates all by themselves, by God's power, and he was able to enter and with, and with that miracle to begin to convert uh, that ruler and all of his followers and spread the gospel all throughout that very pagan area of northern Scotland. He was a, 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 a fierce man, a fierce man when it came to He did terrible deeds of penance. He demanded very much of himself and very much of his followers. But they say, as is often the case, in later life he became a little bit more mellow, a little bit more gentle, and they could see in his face and, and eyes and speech the joy of the Holy Ghost, which is one of the fruits of God, the Holy Ghost. Now, far different is this saint from one of the most recent saints who is honored on this day, and she is the beloved Anna Maria Taigi, who was a housewife in Rome in the late um, 18th, early 19th century, a housewife and a mystic. She, while taking care of her husband Dominic, who was a servant at the Chichi Palace in Rome, and um, taking care of all sorts of, she had one in-law after another stay with her, and each one of these in-laws caused some kind of grief or problem, but she was always very diplomatic, very charitable, always knew the right word or the right way to soothe tempers and make everybody get along in a marvelous way. But at the same time, she was a mystic. She saw a sun before her eyes constantly, and in this sun, she saw the mystical foretelling of events that would occur in the life of the church and whatever other messages God wanted to give to her. And because of this, cardinals and uh, noblemen and noblewomen would crowd their little home. And they wanted to talk to her and ask her for a grace or a blessing because she was able to, uh, God through her worked a number of, uh, of miracles as well as his prophetical word, which is from the Holy Ghost. But she had this as an unfailing rule that whenever her husband came home from work, and later on, he himself bore testimony. He said, I often came home from work in a bad mood. 
But whenever his husband, her, her husband, came home from work, she would leave everything, no matter if it was even a cardinal she was talking to, to go take his shoes off for him and to get him to supper and to soothe him and comfort him a little bit. And because of that, she is not only a great mystic, but she's also a wonderful patroness of those who have the vocation to the married state, a wonderful housewife and mother. She gave very prudent advice. She said, don't try to do too much penance, because if you try to do too much penance, especially the physical kind, you may tire yourself out, and the devil may take advantage of that to make you sin. As well, there's always a temptation to pry. But she said, follow your director, and just follow uh, whatever is permitted to you in, in, in more or less of the standard way. Several saints whom we honor on this day gave that same kind of an advice, which harkens back to what Our Lady said at Fatima, that we are especially to offer up the duties of our state in the penitential, humble, but regular spirit. Today, last of all, remember, is the Feast of Our Lady of Grace. The statue over the altar tonight is the, is the statue of Our Lady under the title of Grace. This reminds us of the truth that Our Lady, whose queenship we honored yesterday, is the Mother of Grace. Padre Pio is particularly devoted to the Blessed Mother under this title. Every grace we have, whether it be the grace to spread the faith to someone else, whether it be the grace to soothe a family member or an in-law who's a little bit agitated, or whether it be the grace to persevere day after day in the practice of penance, to do great or little things in life, every grace we receive, we receive through her who is full of grace. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.